when I was a child, um, I thought it was disgraceful the way people had to travel in interstate or intrastate. They were both equally bad. You're a citizen of the United States, and you can't get on a bus, sometimes in some cities, at the front of the bus, except to put the money that they were charging for the fare in the box, step back to the street, go around to the back of the bus, and get on the bus, having to face um, inadequate and almost impossible conditions if you needed a uh, bathroom facility, if you wanted a drink of water and didn't have a, a cup to drink water out of, you didn't want to drink out of nasty fountain. The fountains were labeled colored and white and you wanted to be treated more civilly. It was just so ridiculous. A waiting room may have had one bench, and if, you know, you couldn't always sit down. Some people sat on luggage, and if, a, if it was a long stay, it was the most uncomfortable thing that you can imagine. And, and some of our senior people who might have had to travel, it was almost an impossible journey, but you were proud when you saw them have the agility to move about like they wanted to, and sometimes I'm sure that they made themselves move. So traveling in the South was unconscionable, and you may not be able to see what I can see right now, broken down signs, no anything except what you had with you. If you got hungry and you wanted anything to eat, you had to whip out your lunch case that you brought. For us, it was usually fruitcake tins or something like that. But I wanted to tell you, wanted to tell you that the food was good that we brought with us because our parents could really burn. Yeah, you could just look across and see that they were way better. And so, uh, most of the time, there might have been plenty of room for you to be comfortable and for you to travel like you were a traveler. But you couldn't go, and the only reason that they could give, color ain't allowed in here. That was the way it was. Yeah, and it, and it was complete with uh, nice lighting, uh, decorative walls, and even if there wasn't decor on the walls, the uh, wall itself may have been tile or maybe a mosaic. It was a pleasant uh, time for those people, but not for us. And it was hard to look across and see all of the amenities that they had and knowing that you couldn't have them because you were black or because you were colored at that time. You know, we've changed the titles of what we were for so many, so many different times, but it was just not acceptable. I never did accept that, and I'm sure many of us never did. White people had everything they needed. They could eat what they wanted. They could sit wherever they wanted to. Even if, if their space had run out the way it was in the South, you had to give them your space. I know they didn't want to sit in, in the waiting rooms that were provided for, for black folks, or Negroes, but if there was anything that they got pushed out of and you had an availability of anything, you had to give it up for them. So you treated less than a person. And that went on forever. I remember that from the time I was big enough to understand where I was and what I was doing, where I was going, until I was reaching near adulthood. I was 19 years old before I could take my place alongside other activists and say, this can't be happening anymore. We're not going to take it anymore. Well, I want you to know something. I, I was led spiritually, and I'm so confident of it. From the time I was a child, church was very important. When I came in here today, I met C.T. Vivian. C.T. Vivian is a backbone of the spiritual development for Nashville and so many other places. 
you, if, if I don't get to tell that, where is the story? I was prepared, not of my own volition, but I was encouraged to read various stories of people in struggle and how they came forward. And so my concern is, and always was and always will be, that we took those stories, ingested them, and then applied them to our present day life. And with that, it gave us strength. And churches were packed, front and back, mass meetings, church services, and people actually prayed. When you hear Negro spiritual, it might be music to you, but it's really substance, that's the meat of the living to me. It is the stories that were told on front porches. It was the Pittsburgh Courier that was transported all over the United States by Pullman Porters. And that was a fabulous thing because you got to know and understand what was happening in surrounding communities, north, east, south, and west. So I'm saying that the questions that are posed have not really given people an opportunity to really get to the nitty gritty of, the, of what actually happened. And what made you say, if I don't stand here, then nobody else will because they won't be able to. When I got involved, I was reading newspaper one day about how students at a and I think in North Carolina, uh, decided that if their money was good enough to buy food at other counters in the store, and I think it was like a dime, so maybe it's Woolworths or maybe another name I can't remember. But, you know, they thought, why isn't my money good enough to use this lunch counter? I wasn't as interested in lunch counters at the time, but I was interested in the theater and facilities because my mother really loved the arts and she took us to everything we could possibly go to. So I, I was really interested. She didn't deserve to not be treated kindly. She's my favorite person in the whole world <laughs> all my life. But uh, I thought, this has to stop. As long as we accept it, then it goes on. But once you stop and say, oh, no, this is not the way life really is supposed to be, and I thought, you know, it's great for students to be here. We're the freest people in the world. We're not obligated to anybody but school. All we needed to do was pass our courses. But if we went through schools like generations had before and just came out, what would be our opportunity? Absolutely nothing. What would be our enrichment? Only the enrichment that we had received along the way. So I didn't know exactly what to do before the Rosa Parks or and, and all of this, but just thinking about Emmett Till's lynching just did something to me, and I thought, we have to do something. And then the opportunity came. This is what we need open. This is what we need to do, and we need to be more together than we are. We have to pray together, do more together than we've ever done before. I first heard about the Freedom Rides around 1960, and it was before the Congress of Racial Equality. Um, I saw in the paper where they were going to test the, the law twice. The Supreme Court had decided that segregation in travel was illegal. And it, the first time was around the late 40s and a group of people went out to test and they were met with adversity. And the second time was 1960, they just determined again, it's illegal. And so I thought, well, this testing is really important. And I wasn't the only one thinking that because so many people came forward. So by the time the um, work was done to put the ride together, and the ride happened, we were ready. We were ready mentally and physically to challenge why the other states who were so determined to call themselves sovereign like the state of Mississippi always did, then it was up to us to take the streets, dramatize the issue, and make America stand up for what it had promised. And so 
I felt, that's me. And when I talked to my friends that I met on the Freedom Rides, they all felt the same way. It was like a wave or wind that you didn't know where it was coming from or where it was going, but you knew you were supposed to be there. Nobody asked me. Nobody told me. Jim Lawson had been teaching nonviolence in Nashville for a while, and you were ready. You had an ear for it. You, you were just ready and you were submerged in listening, you submerged in being directed, you submerged in finding a kindred thought and it was so wonderful. It was like putting yeast in bread. It, it was a leavening effect. I'll tell you what I was thinking at that time. I had read these stories about black folks all my life. I had read uh, because of my mother's insistence about Miss Bethune and how she walked wherever she went, went and what all she did and how she made supper for people and it was just fantastic. And I also had read a story about when the Underground Railroad had happened, how people who missed the, the people leaving to go north kept coming to the spot where they left from and the song was, the people keep a coming even if the train's done gone. And I thought, this is for us. If we keep a coming even if the train's done gone, the idea will finally get out that you can't stop them. And I felt that there was enough people who had gone to the bathroom by getting out of a car on the side of the road, not knowing what was in the bushes, they could have been bitten by snakes or, you know, bobcats or anything. And I thought, we're going to stop this. We have to do something now. And so instead of reading that in the newspaper and letting it go at that, I got up one morning in May, around the latter part of May, the last few days of May, and I said to my folks at home, I won't be back today because I'm a freedom rider. Nobody said anything to me. It was kind of must have been startling to me because my mama didn't say it. They just looked at me. And I walked out of the house and I went to get on the bus with other freedom riders to go to Mississippi. And that's what happened with the freedom rides. Now I had been participating in activities in Nashville prior to the freedom ride, but this was the most serious time that the whole world could face. What I always saw was, if you wanted the real story, then you read the black paper. The circulation may not have been as good, and I thought about that a lot. But whites helped us out without realizing what they were doing. And one great example of that was in the Montgomery bus boycott. They put on the radio, these folks are getting ready to do thus and so. And everybody who didn't already know if they hadn't been to church or beauty shop or barber shop or something got to hear it because it was on the radio. And I thought, that's the way to disseminate news. Everybody heard it then, so that made whatever you were doing be more successful. But they never once realized that every opportunity to stop us was really the greatest effort to help us. So. Uh, that, that's an important feature that I've never heard anybody talking about, but that happened, and it's the truth. No, Churches no. have always really been important, and, and the significance was that that was a place where we could gather. It was a place for our not only our religious development and upbringing, but it was a place where we could go hear all of the great speakers, uh, it was a place with the church and the black colleges, they call them HBCUs now, but with the church and the colleges, we had an opportunity to really appreciate our art. Um, and so the church was really significant because if you brought it to the church, they really didn't realize that you were having such wonderful meetings. They re didn't realize the strength of the church. And so people did put their funds that they had in church, and people organized in church. So this was a powerful place for black America. The church was a place where you really gained your strength. And I always saw it as a 
place where you could let all of these pent up emotions get loose and leave your thinking. Because shouting was really good. It's, you see it in Alan Ailey's dance. I mean, and, and, and I just felt like all these people that have been pent up all week and just couldn't get it out are not only saying, thank you, Jesus, they're able to scream and nobody wants to do anything about it because they understand what you went through. And so it was just a resting place. I'm sure that um, we did have moments where we could scrutinize the various people who were running for political office and recognize who was liberal and who was anti-liberal, or who really had the heart of the community uh, within their grasp and wanted to serve rather than to control or whip or it was the only gathering place that you could go to that was not controlled by white establishment. If you were a black church, that was a separate entity from what the normal people, or people in general, maybe I should say it that way, thought of as being a place together. Nobody stopped you from going to church. They never did. They wouldn't let you go to their church, but they couldn't stop you from going to your own church. And these churches were run by the community and strong black ministers developed in and the, the sermons and the exchanges that they had um, were exchanged freely. So this was a place you didn't have to hide. The church was important because it was a place where you felt free enough to exchange what you needed to exchange. Your ideas were not um, depressed or suppressed. Your ideas were accumulated with everyone else who was offering ideas, and it was a haven where these ideas grew into strategies, and that's what I loved about it. You know we had armor. You know we had headdress. We had it all. And it's all set forth in the sixth chapter of Ephesians. It goes from maybe like from it's, it's the sixth chapter, but I think it goes on down to verses that maybe that's the end of Ephesians anyway, maybe the sixth chapter. I wish I had a copy and I'd read it to you, but we had on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and our feet were shot with the preparation of the gospel truth. All that's important because if you see yourself as a human being struggling and crawling and pushing and pulling. No, but if you see yourself as God's child and know that you're a child of the King, your inheritance is great and you ought to act like it. And it was a trust issue. Do I trust man to annihilate me or do I trust God to put me under the shadow of his wing and carry me from here to there? And I tell you, when you embrace that kind of thing, the Christ in you meets the Christ in your fellow man. And we grew up on Sunday school, learning the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes, saying the Lord's Prayer because that's the only real, real prayer. And, and you were lifted. A way always became available for you to move forward. <laughs> this was a strange thing. You know, when you're on the bus, you're going on the bus and finally, uh, somebody met us in Alabama, said that we were under uh, escort by the Alabama National Guard. So we ride through Alabama and we get off at the Montgomery Greyhound bus terminal. The fighting wasn't happening that day, but there were people who were just so angry. I could, what are they so angry about? You get off the bus and go into the station and they were just looking and, and, and you didn't know whether somebody's going to come and do something or whether they weren't. But the song, We Shall Overcome, has a verse, we are not afraid. So you thought that. You kept yourself, you know, in a frame of mind. And that we wasn't we, the freedom riders, but we, you're not afraid either. So that all of that prayer embraced all of us, not just one of us. Then we 
are in the bus terminal and they they knew we were freedom riders so they didn't dare ask us but they did ask other people in the bus station if they were freedom riders and then uh, another thing on the bus as we were leaving Montgomery uh, we were escorted but the Montgomery the Alabama uh, what do you call it National Guard left us at a certain spot and we were supposed to be escorted by Mississippi when we got to the line and the colonel from the Alabama National Guard said we've gone as far with you as we can and you will be picked up by Mississippi but do you know we went all the way to Mississippi from the point that they left us and nobody was there and people looked at us so crazy and some other writers may be able to tell you what they in Canada didn't see or have any contact with the violence, but it was the stares and the not knowing. And then when we did get to Mississippi, oh, well, was that something? Uh, we got off the bus, you walked in, and you were arrested, and because we weren't supposed to be going in that waiting room because we was colored. <laughs> Ain't that something? You're under arrest. And uh, like, what for? Uh, you're breaking the peace. <laughs> so, you know, it led on city jail, Hines County jail. And I was there in the Hines County jail for about 27 days. Terrible things happened in that jail. It had to be a law made against that. People were processed in, you know, just the most ridiculous ways. The food was horrible. Did you know there was glass and sticks and gravel in the food? Grits. And when they served beans, it was the same thing. Mostly it was in the beans more so than in the grits, but the gravel and grit was there. And then they, um, it was uncomfortable. For instance, there was 27 people, 27 girls in my cell in the Hines County Jail. So we were hip to hip, toe to toe. We had to crawl, you know, to keep from knocking each other down. The mattresses were really thin. So another thing that happened, that I can see it right now, we were on a corner block, all these girls in one cell, and they allowed John Q. Publix, men and women, to come in and observe you as though you were an animal in a cage. You know, it was like they were going to the zoo. And I remember it because my mother was on us constantly about reading. And it was Richard Lovelace that said, iron bars do not a prison make, no, stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. And so I thought we can transport ourselves from here to wherever we want to be without dealing with all of this. So we smiled at them. As one of the elements that I had learned from nonviolent teaching was that you embrace a person. You don't batter them. No matter what they're doing to you, it's, it's agape love. You embrace. And so I'm sure that that carries us through in ways that no one can imagine. It, was, it became natural to us to do that. Well, first of all, you want to hear about the trip that we made from the Hines County Jail to Parchman. This was, if we couldn't, if we didn't keep our wits about us, this could have been an emotional catastrophe for everyone. In the middle of the night at Hines County, we were loaded onto a flatbed truck, truck and it had a tarp over the truck. And they, you know, there's a lot of moss on the trees in certain parts of the South. Mississippi is one. And they said that we were going to go to Money, Mississippi. That's the place where Emmett Till was hung. And we went on this flatbed truck, and they kind of rode around and tried to make it seem a little eerie. But we kept singing, and we kept on thinking and praying and everything else. And when we got to Parchman, now this was in the middle of the night. Who would transport people in the middle of the night from one prison to the other? That was a scare tactic. 
And then when we got to parchment, I could not believe. It was just so many bugs and the floor was dirty. And they had us take off our shoes to go into parchment. And we were worn. We'd been traveling for a long time and we had been in this, in this county jail for a long time and we really didn't have the facilities to keep ourselves as clean as we would like. And then they, uh, they, we complained so bitterly about you know, the conditions that they were deplorable. And we got processed in, fingerprinted and mug shots. And we, you know, we didn't, we weren't suitable to be taking mug shots. And all those mug shots are in a book. But um, we got in and the food was really terrible. And then, if those things weren't bad enough, we were 13 footsteps away from death row. And I just thought that was, that's horrible. And our charge was breach of the peace, and we were felons. That <laughs> just, it just doesn't sit right with you. Right today it doesn't. And uh, sometimes the lights would dim, and you know you didn't know if somebody was being executed. You didn't know. We never knew. Still don't know if they were or if they weren't. But our time at Parchment was really something. But when you say you can take a bad situation and turn it into a moment of opportunity, today I'm even proud of the people that I shared that cell block with because there were people who were Greek historians, Roman historians. We had every discipline that you can imagine. So we exchanged stories about our disciplines and we shared things. We shared the activities that we had encountered in, in our home states and elsewhere. You, 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 we, we shared our own stories with one another. We had Protestants, Catholics, and Jews every denomination you can think of. And we shared those. We even read from our, our Bibles, the New Testament, the Old Testament. Uh, somebody who was Catholic had uh, their Catholic books and they read from those. And so the main focus for us was to stay together, not to degrade or criticize or do anything but to embrace one another. And when we found a way to do that, that really set a nice tone for us. We sang a lot. And I remember the jailers asking us, do y'all have to sing those songs? And of course we did. And we kept on singing. And you know, uh, when the stories were exchanged by all of these students, they asked us not to one time because some of the Folk stories are kind of humorous, you know, and we laughed and they said we were making too much noise. And it was just hilarious. And we weren't supposed to be having fun in there, you know. We were supposed to be really scared and shaking in our shoes because of being that close to death row. But we couldn't stop laughing. And do you know they came and took our mattresses away from us? They were thin anyway. And so we slept on steel beds. And steel beds have big holes in them, bigger than a silver dollar. And so we were so cold at night. It was really cold. They opened all the windows and, and, and I guess turned on fans. I don't know that they had air conditioning then, but it, we would just freeze. And just as soon as the day came and the temperatures started to rise, they would shut off everything. you just swelter. It took your strength away during the daytime to be in that sweltering heat inside a prison. And you could see the windows were up high, but if you could manage to get up high, you could see people who were imprisoned. Maybe these were men, and they were going out to work in the fields, and it was like a back in slavery, you know, people getting up early in the morning, going out to work in the fields. All that was supposed to do something to our psyche, but we were so grateful that it was a learning experience, that we were there for a purpose, and we weren't going to have to be treated this way forever. You know, some of the stories have, if you know the stories, I guess you can 
you can remember, or even you can ad lib, but to actually, you know, do the the verbiage for them was good. And everybody uh, there may not have had the same experience, but it was wonderful mechanisms to survive. You can be creative wherever you are. And when the time arose, we were. People in jail. You see, the, the cell block that I was in didn't give you much room to really do a lot of that because it was three people in a six by nine cell where I was. And I'm sure that everybody was not in a six by nine cell. Like at Hines County, we were in that big room, but there was one time when I was put in the room with people who weren't Freedom Riders, and it was like a, an infirmary, and I wasn't sick. But I was put there for some reason, and I'm saying that in places where they could, people gave speeches, acted out different plays. They wore, uh, make, took their sheets and made togas <laughs> out of them. And, and especially the people who were uh, uh, Greek majors and had so much going for them in terms of Roman history. You can be so creative, and I found out that to be educational and fun. Parchment, I mean, so that was supposed to be the worst place on earth. And some of our men tell us of experiences that they had that were even more, you know, engaging and terrific and, you know, creative than some of us might have been able to produce. But it was a time of creativity. There ain't no hiding place down here, lots of Negro spiritual. Um, that was the strangest thing. I had gone to T Tennessee and I State University, it's called TSU now. Oh, that, that, that was the favorite song that I liked. But there was a girl there from Nashville, went to the same school. She'd been given a four-year scholarship to TSU. And it, when times got really hard and you felt like you was way down yonder by yourself when you couldn't hear nobody pray, well, she sang, We Are Our Heavenly Father's Children. And she was never just talking about freedom riders. It was talking about the people in the jail, the people in the community, everybody. And that really got me going. It lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else would do, love lifted me. And I felt that her song was given to her so she could sing that at the right moment. And she did every day when it was time to sing it, she did. She automatically burst into it. And I know she was moved because she, she didn't even look like the same person as she sang. It was joyous. And her name is Joy, Joy Reagan. Hers. We are our heaven, live father's children. That's how it starts. Well, that was hers and it became mine as she sang it. But I liked, oh freedom, oh freedom, oh freedom over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Yeah, that, I like that. Whenever we were moved to, sometimes the songs would be raised by different individuals, maybe when they needed to. But it was a whole host of songs. The guards were affected in a way that they would say, especially this one lady, I can still see her face too. She had on her guard uniform and she would come to the cell and she would say, do y'all have to sing them songs? Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do, we gotta sing them. That's, that's, our, that's our sustenance, that's our that's our meal, you know, we had to. It was the words, and it was the, the melody, and it was, uh, it made you think. If you heard that and you know 
the people who are singing it, you got to think about it. I've never heard anybody sing a Negro spiritual that voices weren't hushed and listening, you know, concentrated on. It's a wonderful thing to have a Negro spiritual. They weren't very polite and nice at all. And I remember on the bus how they were. The policemen in Mississippi seemed so big to me. I don't know what they fed them. They were really big. And you know how you, you, you have these short sleeve shirts and you turn them up to get an extra cuff? I looked there and I said, what are they feeding you guys? Now, what, how did you get that big? I'd never seen a white guy that big. I've seen athletes be pretty big, but oh, these were the biggest guys. And I always thought, well, that's part of their intimidation tactic, you know? But um, the guards, we didn't see much of except the ones walking up and down the cell block from time to time, but they weren't very polite. I got out of parchment. I remember getting out, and uh, I got my belongings. And uh, a lot of people from all over the country, different colleges, different friends that we'd met, and friends that were friends of people who knew we were in jail, uh, cards from different people. We got all of our things, and we were received with welcome arms by our attorney. His name was Jack Young. He was a civil rights attorney in Jackson. And he and his wife welcomed us to their house. And then we were um, taken to various places to eat. And people were very kind to us and grateful for, for the work that we'd been doing. And um, then we went to places where we needed to go. Some went on to work in Mississippi on voter registration. Some went home, some tried to go back to school. Everybody had a, had a place that they needed to go. The Freedom Rides accomplished a breakdown in segregated travel throughout the country on all modes of transportation. Uh, planes, airplanes, you know, we had problems on airplanes, buses, trains, any place. Uh, for opening of facilities as you traveled by car. There was no, no, you, nobody born after the 60s can say that they had to stop on the side of the road to go to the bathroom, okay? Um, it opened up jobs. Uh, we had, uh, I had never seen uh, a black bus driver before I was 21 or 22. We had Greyhound and Trailways hired bus drivers. I even saw a, a black conductor on a train after that. So uh, there were just so many avenues that were open. It made the economy better when, you know, you have people spending now and can use facilities. And then um, you had people training. It made, it made jobs better. And it did, it opened up jobs that weren't uh, blue-collar jobs or menial jobs. People had an opportunity to go to all kinds of job facilities and be trained. And then people graduating had an opportunity. As a matter of fact, being at Tennessee State, um, the Urban League was so proud of the accomplishments that had been made. We had a reunion of all the Tennessee State students in the early 60s to see just how many people had gotten better opportunities because of our activities. Well, I think in some cases, um, there was still a lot to, to be opened up. There was. And, and, and I'm certain of that because there's a story in a Southern Patriot that talked about a lady who came to get on a bus to go someplace after the Freedom Rides had sort of survived. But you know, the Freedom Rides lasted from May 1961. It went on through the end of that year. And the, it, did you know that the sentences became longer and the fines became higher? And so we had to deal with all of that. But all of that was reversed when it was determined that we really had not breached any peace. And all of that was alleviated. Not only that, did you know that 
I was along with several other students who would put out a school, and then uh, so we had to get all of our records had to to be documented to show exactly what happened to us. Letters were written to the governor and to the Board of Regents in that state. They did absolutely nothing. It took them 47 years to beg our pardons and then, um, you know, get rid of all of that. But we had to carry um, uh, on our records that we were felons and charged with Regents Peace. You know, that, that kept you from sometimes going where you needed to go. But what it did do was gave us an opportunity to go use all the skills that we had learned 